When we were doing sentential logic, our semantic section looked sort of like this. What we were interested in doing was analyzing the truth values and the truth functions of our logical connectives. And so we ended up doing truth tables and we could analyze all sorts of properties. But remember that in general, a truth table, although it could assess things like validity and invalidity for our arguments, uh, it was sort of unwieldy because we had this problem. We had n atomics, we would need 2 to the n rows, and we would need as many columns as we had atomics, connectives, and everything. And so truth tables can be really big and messy, and that's why derivations are actually quite nice. But what about in predicate logic? In predicate logic, can we use truth tables? Well, take a look at a sentence like this. For all x, fx, there exists a y, fy, and lxy. We're not just interested anymore in the truth and the meaning behind the connectives. What we need to look at is the actual relationship of the uh, sort of members of the universe of discourse themselves and how they stand in, say, the L relation or whether or not they're a member of the F predicate. And so this is actually pretty complicated depending on what these things actually mean. So one interpretation of the sentence is everyone loves someone, or another interpretation is every number is less than some number. So when I look at it this way, it's unclear whether or not I can actually use a truth table at all to analyze what this sentence says and means. Now the limitation here on truth tables isn't really just about how many rows. What I mean is it's not a practical limitation. This is actually a fundamental limitation of truth tables and semantics. We can't use truth tables to look at our predicates and relations because they're not truth functional the way uh, our logical connectives were. They actually depend very much so on how we interpret things. And so what we need to do is we actually need to cash out the meanings of our predicates, the meanings of our relations, specify our universe of discourse, and really try and make sense of the meaning of the sentences themselves. So we need new tools here in order to understand meaning, and it's not just about the truth relationships of our parts of our sentences. When we're interested in meaning, we actually have to know how we give meaning typically to things. Uh, so there are three standard ways in which we actually attribute meaning to some sort of word or phrase or term. Uh, the first is ostension. Ostension is what we do a lot of the time when we're sort of learning and teaching, and it's typically what is used for little kids. Ostension is really when you just start pointing at things. So if I want to say, oh, I want to learn what green is, I'll, I'll sort of learn by ostension. I get someone to point out all the green things, and then point out a bunch of non-green things, and eventually I can sort of understand what it means. We're not interested in ostension in this course, but it is sort of just nice to know that that is a standard way we attribute meaning. The other two ways of attributing the meaning are intentional and extensional definitions. An intentional definition is sort of a standard dictionary definition where you sort of tell me in English what uh, the meaning of the word is, and an extensional definition is something different. That's when you actually specify everything that belongs to that word, and we'll sort of look at extension closely soon. Now I've already mentioned the idea of an interpretation. An interpretation is when we actually bestow meaning onto all our predicates and all the sort of aspects of our logical symbols. So an interpretation will specify what the universe of discourse is, what the predicates mean, what the constants refer to, uh, things about the sentential sentences, operations, etc. Now we've seen interpretations a lot in the past. In fact, an abbreviation scheme is very similar to an interpretation. And that should make sense. An, inter an, an abbreviation scheme lets us actually associate meaning with abstract symbolic language. Let's try to put forward some intentional interpretations of for all x, fx, arrow, gx, sort of see if we can understand how this works. Now here's an example of an intentional interpretation. Notice that I specify the universe of discourse. The universe of discourse is edible things. So that means when I say for all x, I'm not just saying anything, x is anything. I'm saying x is any member of my universe of discourse. So x is any edible thing. f1 is the predicate is bacon. G1 is the predicate is tasty. So under this intentional interpretation, I'm actually saying all bacon is tasty. But you can have other sort of weirder intentional interpretations. I could say the universe of discourse is rocks, and then F is a quartz, and G is alive. And then the sentence actually says, if you're quartz, then you're alive, or all quartz are alive. So as you can see, some intentional interpretations will render a sentence true, and some intentional interpretations will render a sentence false. Extensional interpretations are a little different, and what we do is we rely on set theoretic notation. Like I said earlier, an extensional definition is one where we actually just stipulate all the members of the word, all the things and, or objects or entities that the term or predicate or word actually picks out. So here's an example. Here I can say the universe of discourse is the set of philosophers, and F is the set of logicians, and G is the set of amazing. 
uh, things, essentially. So this says all logicians are amazing, but that's only the case amongst philosophers. Uh, so this is a bit of a weird extensional interpretation. A better example of an extensional inter interpretation is where I really explicitly state all the members of the predicate and the universe of discourse in a set. So here I'm going to say my UD is 1, 2, 3, comma, dot, dot, dot. So I'm sort of pointing out that the universe of discourse is just the natural numbers. My F predicate is 10, 20, 30, dot, dot, dot. So these, intuitively speaking, are going to be the multiples of 10. And then my G predicate is 2, 4, 6, dot, dot, dot. And what I've said in the sentence then are all multiples of 10 uh, in, within the natural numbers are even. So an extensional interpretation is a perfectly legitimate way of bestowing meaning to a predicate logic sentence. Now, intentional versus extensional, the question is, why would you prefer one over the other, and can you move seamlessly back and forth? Well, in general, you can, but there are some sort of hiccups here and there. So here's an example of an intentional definition of A. A is the natural number between 1 and 6. And the extensional definition should pick out the exact same objects. So here, A1 is 2, 3, 4, 5. Or to be more precise, it's the set of 2, 3, 4, 5. And and then the extensional definition of A is the same as the intentional definition of A. Uh, here's another example. I started with the extensional definition, Rob Ford, Olivia Chow, and John Tory. And what's an intentional definition that capture this? Well, we have to be a bit careful, and I can say that A is a top three candidate in the last Toronto municipal election in 2014. So you can see that there's actually going to be multiple intentional definitions that can identify the same extensionally defined set. And that's actually fine. And this distinction here is typically between what's called sense and reference. I'm not going to get into this here, uh, but you've probably heard me talk about it in class already. Here's another example. C, A is a natural number. Well, that's nicely, easily defined and intentional. But you can see that when I go extensionally, I actually have to sort of gesture at the idea that it's an infinite set using three dots. Uh, that's not a big deal. It's perfectly clear what I mean here. So the intentional and extensional, you can use either one. But sometimes an extensional definition is actually quite easy to use. And it's really awkward to try and figure out what the intentional definition of something is. So here I have green, bus, French toast, pig, etc. And what are these? Well, I don't know. These are sort of just a random collection. And if I had to define them intentionally, I would actually have to try and figure out a way that these are sort of related so that I can sum it up. Uh, and sometimes this is actually difficult. So we can see that there are times where the intentional definition is nice, and there are times where the extensional definition is quite nice as well. Now with names, intentional and extensional are the same. The reason why is because names pick out a particular individual, so I am actually not ever invoking some sort of set or anything. So in both intentional and extensional interpretations, names will actually just pick out one specific thing. Important to this is that you need to know how set theoretic notation works. Now, set theoretic notation is quite straightforward. We use the curly brackets, and within the curly brackets, we have elements or members of the set. And each element or member of the set is separated by a comma. The comma themselves are not actually members or elements at all. They are just dividers so that we can clearly mark when we have one entity or one element versus another element. So here I have E2 is an element of A, so is E1 and E3, and so on. And for B, the set of 0 is itself an element of B. So this might seem a bit strange, but you can have sets where their members are also sets themselves. That's actually perfectly common in set theory. The last important concept you need to know about set theory is that you can have a set with no members. Uh, philosophically, this is actually sort of debated in the past, but now it's perfectly acceptable that you can have what's called the empty set or the null set. And you can either use the empty set symbol or you can just use a, a literal empty set. For the rest of this lecture, we're going to focus on intentional interpretations. And we're going to look at how intentional interpretations can sort of ask uh, and answer questions about properties of sentences, sets of sentences, and arguments. Part two in semantics will cover extensional interpretations, which we sometimes call models. So our task now is now that we actually know how to set up an intentional interpretation, we need it to do things for us. We need to be able to manipulate an interpretation so that it can make things true or false. In this example, I have for all x, fx, there exists a y, g, y, and lxy. 
and I want an intentional interpretation that somehow makes this true. Now, I can just define my universe of discourse and my predicates in any way I want using the English language. So here's a first shot. I can say that the universe of discourse is unrestricted. So if I say for all X, I mean anything at all. Let's say F is a dog, G is a mammal, and then L2 is A chases B. Well, if I plug this in, what am I really saying? I'm saying that if you're a dog, then there is some mammal that chases, that you chase. If you're a dog, there is some mammal that you chase, some generic mammal. Okay, well, is this true? Actually, it's sort of unclear if this is true. I sort of have to know something about the entire real world and dogs and mammals and whether or not dogs actually chase everything. Is it possible that there is a dog that just doesn't chase anything, not even its tail? And once I have to start asking these questions, eh, things get a little annoying. It's really unclear if I've actually generated a model that makes it true or that makes it false or I just can't tell. And that's why this type of interpretation is a little eh, not so satisfactory. So instead, we can move to an interpretation which is still an English interpretation and it's intentional, but it's actually much clearer. So now I can say my universe of discourse is the natural numbers. And let's say the F predicate is a multiple of four, the G predicate is even, and then I have L2, A is larger than B. So what I've really said is every single multiple of four is larger than some even number. And is that true? Actually, that's unequivocally true. That's clearly true. It's not going to be depend on my knowledge of numbers or multiple four. That's actually just true in virtue of mathematics. And so this is a really nice example of an intentional interpretation where the result is clear. What if I want to make this false? Well, then I just need a way to actually render this universal conditional false. And there's multiple ways to do that. So here's an example. Uh, I can take the, my universe of discourse to be people, the F predicate is doctor, the G predicate is person, and then I can say L2 is A has saved the life of B. So this says all doctors have saved the life of some generic person. Uh, well, is that true? Uh, well, it doesn't seem to be. Like I can imagine that there are all sorts of doctors, myself included, who have definitely not saved the life of anyone. Well, maybe that's not what I mean by doctor, maybe I mean medical doctor, and so on. And then so I'm trying to think of a way that I can just uh, concretely show that this is false. But again, because I'm using ideas like saving life of, doctors, people, it's actually sort of hard to tell whether or not it's false. So instead, I can move back to the natural numbers and actually generate an intentional interpretation where it's clear that I have rendered this sentence false. I can say F is odd, G is even, and L2, A is greater than B. Now the sentence says, every odd number is greater than some even number. And that's false. Why is that false? Because there is one particular odd number that is not greater than any other natural number, and that number is 1. 1 is a odd number, but it's not greater than anything, not even itself. So this statement is false under this interpretation. Now there are potentially other ways that I could make this true or false using some sort of logical tricks, and I don't necessarily have to resort to the natural numbers. Uh, I can do something clever like this. If I want to make this statement true, it suffices to notice that it's a conditional after the universal. So one trivial way of making a conditional true is by rendering the antecedent false. So that is to say, if I can actually create an interpretation where there's no f's at all, then this conditional statement will be true. So I can say, fine, unrestricted universe of discourse, don't care what g is, apparently g is a taco, l is greener than b, doesn't matter. What all that matters is I've set up my f predicate to be a flying pig. And what I mean by that is there is nothing in my universe of discourse that satisfies the f predicate. And because of that, the antecedent is false, which means the entire sentence is true. So don't forget your truth tables of your original connectives from sentential semantics really do help out here. Of course, you could argue that, I don't know, maybe flying pigs might exist somewhere. How do I know? So could I make this logically tighter? Sure, I could. I could say A is a round square or something like that and just make it so it's super tight in the sense that the, the antecedent is empty, as in F is just an empty predicate. Uh, so in this example, I'm actually using sort of more logical connections and this idea of making things sort of clear uh, to render the sentence false. F is green, G is red, and L2 is A is the same color as B. So now the sentence says, every, any green thing, 
uh, that is the same color as some red thing. And that's clearly false. So when you come up with intentional interpretations, you've got to make sure that I can't just ask, well, is it actually true? Is it actually false? And it have it depend on things. Interestingly, because I've shown that this sentence has some interpretations that make it true and some interpretations that make it false, I can conclude something about the sentence itself. I know it's not a tautology. I know it's not a contradiction. In fact, I've just demonstrated that this sentence is contingent using interpretations. So I've mentioned already twice that natural numbers are a really nice model for your interpretations. And the reason why is because the natural numbers are clear. I'm not going to run into any cases where there's confusion about what the predicates mean. So I strongly suggest that you actually use the natural numbers for your English language intentional interpretations. Uh, it makes life a lot easier than trying to think of what's greener than this or what's faster than that. Uh, but some of you might become un un a bit uncomfortable with the natural numbers, but there's really not that much you need to know. You need to know that the natural numbers are 1 through uh, the, the counting numbers. Notice that I don't include 0 as a natural number. That's actually somewhat of a matter of debate, but I'm just going to sort of assume that 0 is not a natural number. And then I also say that it's worth knowing that the number of evens uh, is the exact same as the number of odd numbers, so they're the same. Uh, 2 is the even, only even prime number, 1 is the smallest number, there is no largest number at all. Uh, like Basic facts like this will sort of help you sort out the natural numbers so that you can come up with nice intentional uh, interpretations or models. Now it's also very helpful to have some relations at your fingertips when you're creating these interpretations under the natural numbers. So you should know some easy single place uh, predicates like even or odd. You can do more complicated ones if you want to, but even and odd are just the nicest even, uh, easy ones to use. You can also know some easy two place relations. So the standard ones are less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to. Now, there's a lot more information here that you can take a look at, but you should also know what the negations of these relations are. Not even is clearly the same as odd, and not odd is clearly the same as even. Well, that's okay. But not less than, well, what does that mean? If you're not less than, does that mean you're greater than? Actually, that's not true. No, the negation of less than is greater than or equal to. So you need to Take your time and get to know the natural numbers and the relations and how they work, but this will really help you understand how to create intentional interpretations moving forward. Let's look at a full example of a question where we need to show that the following argument is invalid. Now in derivations we always just showed something was valid and we didn't really ask how to show invalidity. And the way we do it is actually through semantics. We're going to show, using an intentional interpretation, that this argument is invalid. So before I begin, it is worth just taking the time to break down what this argument is actually saying. And if I look at the first premise, what does it mean? It says there exists an x and for all y, not fxy. So what this really is saying is some specific a does not stand in the f relation to everything. Everything what? Well, everything in the universe of discourse. When I look at the second premise, I can break it down in a similar way. And I can essentially translate it abstractly into saying that some b stands in the f relation to some non-a. Okay? And then finally, for the conclusion, I have that it's not the case that some generic a stands in the f relation to all b's. Now, what I've basically done is I've done a translation here without an abbreviation scheme. I've used things like f's and the f relation, a's standing in, and I use set theoretic language a lot of the time to do this description. And this sort of just helps me get a basic understanding of the meaning. Now that I have this meaning down, I'm ready to set up my interpretation. And setting up my interpretation just amounts to putting forward an, an, an interpretation scheme for my universe of discourse, all the predicates, all the relations, all the names, constants, etc. So it will look something like this. Now I'm going to stick to my suggestion earlier, and I will only use the natural numbers as my universe of discourse, because the natural numbers make things quite easy. And then I just sort of need to ask, OK, well, what should A be? What should B be? What should F be? Such that I will make the premises true and the conclusion false. And I don't really have to get this right the first time. I can sort of just guess, fiddle around with it, take a look, and see. But I can look to the definitions, sorry, the meanings of these sentences for a bit of guidance. So if I say some specific A does not stand in the F relation to everything, OK, well, that gives me some ideas. But some B stands in the F relation to some non-A, OK. And some generic A stands in the F relation to all Bs. Uh, OK, well, that's actually sort of interesting, too. So instead, what I'm going to say is I'm just going to suggest that I go with F 
meaning A is greater than B. And why am I picking this? Well, I might have actually sort of gleaned some information from the meaning of the sentences, but even if I guessed wrong, it's not a big deal. I can just correct it as I go. Now, if this means, if F means A is greater than B, well then a natural interpretation of this that will work is that A is odd and B is the predicate for even. And the reason why this makes sense is let's look at the first premise. It says some specific A does not stand in the F relation to everything. So what I'm trying to say then is there is some specific odd number that is not greater than any natural number. Is that true? And yes it is. It's actually the number one like we talked about earlier. One is an odd number that is not greater than any other number. So that makes the first premise true. Second premise says some B stands in the F relation to some non-A. Is there an even number that is greater than something that's not odd, also known as even? Is there an even number greater than an even number? Of course there is. Four is greater than two? No problem. Now to show that this argument is invalid, I need my interpretation to render the conclusion false, which means instead of I, I don't want to show that not the case that some generic A stands in the F relation to all Bs, I actually want to show that it is the case that some generic A stands in the F relation to all Bs. So is it the case that there is some generic odd number that is greater than every single even number? Well, actually it is. Pick your even number, add one, and there's a generic odd number that is always bigger than it. So here's an interpretation that I developed. It's intentional, and it shows that this argument is invalid. A challenge would be to find an interpretation of this, an intentional interpretation, where you used non-mathematical predicates. So you would do something like, is faster than, is taller than, is larger than, uh, and something like that. That's actually going to be pretty tricky, because then you're going to have to face the difficulties I faced earlier, which is we weren't sure exactly that that was true. With numbers, there's no doubt about it. I know that one is the smallest natural number, and no one can dispute that. So now that we can come up with interpretations, what is it that can we actually show? Well, we actually have to remember all the possible properties that we used to be able to show in sentential semantics. Now, in sentential semantics, we actually define these properties in terms of truth value assignments and rows in a, t in a truth table. But we actually don't do that anymore because we're not using truth tables. The only difference in the properties themselves is that now properties for predicate logic are defined in virtue of all possible interpretations. And so you'll see that the definitions are pretty much the same, except we're talking about interpretations and not truth tables. Here's our list of properties that we know for sentences, sets of sentences, and arguments. The only difference, other than the interpretations that I just mentioned, is that uh, a lot of the time when we're talking about sentences and predicate logic and we're talking about interpretations, instead of using the phrase tautology, people will actually call it a logical truth. And instead of using the phrase contradiction, people will call it a logical falsehood. There's no actual particular reason for this other than the fact that some people like to differentiate between sentential and predicate logic in this way. But inherently, they mean the same thing, and you'll hear me oftentimes use logical truth and sometimes use tautology interchangeably, and that's okay because they have the same meaning. Now if we look at this chart, we realize that we're actually in a very similar position to how we were when we were doing shortened truth tables and sentential. And that situation is, I can generate interpretations that render things true, false, uh, valid, invalid, well, maybe not valid, but I can't actually do anything that involves me showing all interpretations. So look at the definition of a tautology. To show a sentence as a tautology, I would actually have to show that it's true in all interpretations, every single interpretation. How many interpretations are there? Well, at least infinitely many, and there's no way that I can actually do that. So my skill of interpretations is quite limited. In fact, anything that requires me to show a property that involves all interpretations, I just inherently can't do. And they're not really sort of candidates for me to do. So what I can show then, with my limited abilities, is that something is contingent, consistent, or invalid. And that's sort of what I'm going to be working on right now. So does that mean that it is actually impossible in semantics to show something that requires all interpretations? That using just semantics, I can't show something as a tautology, or I can't show that something is valid? Well, it doesn't mean that. It just means I need a different sort of way to approach it. And what I need to do is sort of do a very informal, semantically-fueled derivation. So what I'm going to be doing now are English explanations of why certain things have certain properties. And these are like informal derivations, and the key is that they use the language of semantics, and they use things like set theoretic language so that we can really understand what's going on.
Now the idea here is that I take something and I want to show that it's a logical truth, for example, and I really just need to analyze what's going on and explain to you in English why this sentence actually has the property I claim it to have. So I can't show you that this is true in every single interpretation because that's actually just physically impossible. So instead I just look at this and I realize that it's a disjunction. So if I want to show that it's a logical truth, all I need to show is that it can never be false. And the disjunction is only false in one case, it's when both disjuncts are false at the same time. So if I can convince you that this cannot be the case, that both disjuncts cannot both be false at the same time, then I've convinced you that it's a logical truth. Okay, well how am I going to do that? I sort of just look at it and I say, okay fine. I basically construct a mini derivation. Suppose that the left disjunct is false. So the left, left disjunct says there is something that's an f. So it really is just saying f is non-empty. But if it's false, then it's saying f is empty. There is nothing in my universe of discourse that has the property of f. Okay, well suppose that's the case. If the left disjunct is false, what does the right disjunct have to be? Well, if you look at the form of the right disjunct, it's a universal conditional. So it says if anything is an f, then it's not a g. But this is where things get interesting. Because I've supposed that nothing is f, that f is empty, when I look at the right disjunct, I realize that nothing is f, which means the antecedent of this conditional is false because f is empty, which means the entire conditional is true. And so what I've just shown is that whenever the left disjunct is false, the right disjunct must be true. So really what I've shown is it's impossible for both disjunctions to be false at the same time, hence this is a logical truth. And I showed it to you by using semantic language and doing a very, very casual, informal derivation. What about this? I want to generate an explanation for why this argument is valid. Well, this is actually a theorem, so at first you might say, oh, this is a bit strange, how do I do it? But you just have to remember, what derivations has taught us is it's taught us how to reason in natural language. And I know how to approach a theorem without any sort of complications. If I want to show that this is a valid theorem of first order logic, all I need to show is that if, under, if I assume the antecedent is true, I just need to show that the consequent follows, and that's it. So I'm just going to start by saying, I'm going to assume that the antecedent is true, I'm going to ask what that means, and then I'm going to look at the consequent and say, hey, does it follow that the, the conditional has to be true? Is it the case that the consequent is always true whenever the antecedent is true? So what does the antecedent say? Well, it says some specific f stands in the L relation to everything. So some specific f stands in the L relation to everything. Okay, that's fine. So it says that there is something that's an f, and I don't know, let's call it I. What's I? It's just some perfectly arbitrary title because I just don't really have anything else to call it and I can't call it anything I know because that would be cheating. So if I know that some specific F, call it I, stands in the L relation to everything, what does the consequence say? The consequence says everything stands in the L relation to some generic F. Notice the interplay of the quantifiers here. I'm relying on all my knowledge of symbolization and translation to really help me in the semantic section. I know that because the universal comes before the existential, that that existential invokes a generic thing, a generic f. So if I assume the antecedent is true, is the consequent also necessarily true? Well, if there's some specific thing, call it i, that stands in the L relation to everything, is it the case that everything stands in the L relation to some generic f? Well, in fact, yes it is, because everything at the very minimum uh, stands in the f relation to that, uh, the L relation to that specific f in the first place. So these basically are almost saying the same thing. Uh, it's true that the conclusion is uh, open to other things standing in the relation as well, but that's not a problem. The antecedent clearly implies the consequent, and the idea is I can convince you of that just by breaking down the raw meanings of the antecedent and the consequent. Showing something is valid or a logical truth or a logical falsehood by an English explanation can sometimes be a bit tedious, especially if you have to actually do something like a biconditional, because then you need to show both sides of the biconditional are true, uh, and then the biconditional itself is true. But what you really need to realize is this is sort of like a simulation for where you're planning your own verbal or written arguments. It's a simulation for you to realize that if you're trying to show certain things, you just have to understand what the relations are, what you're allowed to assume, and what is it that you're trying to ultimately demonstrate. 
And if you can do this using the right sort of language, well, this is essentially semantics. So with an intentional interpretation, we can actually say and demonstrate isolated cases similar to how we were able to do in shortened truth tables. But the missing piece was how we tackle the all cases, and that is where we do these English semantic style mini arguments.